This is Podkit, episode 15, Nothing Much to See Here, on Sunday, December 6th, 2015. And now, there are no drivers whatsoever. This episode of Podkit is hosted by Brandon Johnson, Brian Mitchell, and Ryan Rampersett. This episode has show notes at thenexus.tv slash pk15. Hey, everybody. Happy Sunday. Yeah. And it's only been a week. I know, only one week. That's remarkable. We're following our schedule. Since, what, August or July? Pretty much, pretty much. But we've got lots of stuff to talk about, so it's a good thing that we're all here. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Well, we have some follow-up this week. We do indeed. And we never have follow-up. But we do now. Now, this is not follow-out, so it's okay. (laughs) Syracuse approved. (laughs) Yeah, so let's see. I have to... uh, Standard follow-up, might you say? I have to remember what our follow-up is here. And um, Andrew Bailey sent us this follow-up, and I hope somebody actually knows how to find their follow-up. I'm looking at it right now. I as well. So okay. there, there are a couple of things, but um, wh- one of the ones that I'm kind of most interested in is the uh, difference between Quest slash CenturyLink DSL routers or DSL modems and uh, Comcast DSL modems. I'm with Andrew Bailey and uh, I've only ever used uh, in my own house, I've only ever used a cable modem, uh, but I know lots of people who've used uh, DSL modems from a provider like Quest or CenturyLink. And almost all of our cable ones are just kind of dumb bridge routers. That's mm-hmm. it. Uh, but most CenturyLink folks and most Quest folks have a DSL modem combined with a Wi-Fi router, combined with like a huge 11 million port switch uh, Not that quite. does all the things. <laughs> Not quite, but pretty close. Yeah. Whereas I literally just plug a coax cable into one end of mine and get one Ethernet out. <laughs> That's it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, also in uh, Morris, we're going to school, their Mediacom, they... They use cable, but they use cable modems, but they have uh, routers built in. So they're more similar to, I guess, the CenturyLink Quest. So I've always um, had. Well, we did have Comcast here for a while, but there were extenuating circumstances for that. But mm-hmm. uh, I've always had Quest or CenturyLink devices. Otherwise, and I feel pretty pretty certain that we've always had at least a modem and router built into the same unit. It w- didn't always provide Wi-Fi, but uh, for the longest time, it has. Nice. Mine Not that we use it. Wi-Fi, but... the, 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 the modem I have is a C1000A, I believe. And ah. um, there was a story behind that we don't need to get into, but it, it's, um, it's very hard to find DSL modems that will work with CenturyLink Quest because it seems like they kind of maintain this monopoly on these DSL products. Oh, totally. And of course, yeah. they're all action tech um, made. So yeah, definitely. So this C one thousand that you uh, the C one thousand A. Yeah, that's exactly the same as a Quest Q one thousand. Well, or they're very you... similar. Oh, so what you're telling because... me is the Q and the C have something to do with which generation Quest they're from? Uh huh. Yep. Oh, there you go yep. then. Yep. Which is very, like, that's a total CenturyLink thing to do, because CenturyLink has purchased 11 million, uh, yeah. Yep, Angry subscribers. It's very, yeah, it's very, very, very similar. Yep. Um, just it literally looks only barely different. And uh, as a result, all of these different companies that used to all contract with Action Tech or Zixel or Westel or whatever the other uh, equipment manufacturers are, um they all basically have these different contracts and now that CenturyLink owns them, they just all have different uh, different letters in front of them to indicate which which provider originally contracted with the manufacturer of these machines. And oh, interesting. Everything else is different. At least that's that's how I understand it. That's how it's looking to me. Yeah. Because yeah. my parents have the Zyxel Q100. Yeah. That, nice. that's, an, that's another one of them that they offer. Mm-hmm. It's probably the cheapest, I would imagine. Yeah, ours cost a hundred bucks, and yeah, I have no idea what this was, but it's at least six years old. Mm-hmm. They don't change too often, so that's good at least. <laughs> no. We did have to update at one point when we got higher speed. Yep, but nice. That's, that's what we had to do that too. Yep. Stuff. How cool? How uh, okay, cool. what else do we have here in follow up? Uh, how many I'm sorry more about games? The sniffing. Oh, okay, sniffing. Yeah, I was I was getting over being sick, and I don't know. Yeah. 
my apologies. Uh, how many war games does Matt New Machine uh, perform? Well, Matt's machine with the War Game Rust edition, it performs about 140. For reference, my i7 3770K here performs about 100. So nice. 40 more games per millisecond. Do you have a compiled version of yes, that version of War Games? Yes, I will link it to you shortly in, in the notes. Awesome. Uh, yeah, that'd be com- interesting to see if we can hear what other people are getting. There are, do you com- have a- there are compiled a- versions for all major operating systems, in fact. Nice. So- Even iOS? Yeah, uh, that's not a major <laughs> operating system. <laughs> Depending I wonder on who you if, ask, if it's the yeah. second largest in the world. I don't know what kind of compiler. I, I, if I'm jailbroken, I think I could compile something on there. I don't know what compiler it uses, but... And so while I was exploring um, hardware benchmarking, you know, in addition to the war game, I would also be running like uh, Prime 95 or Furmarks or Unhaven. Uh, In addition to all of that, I also found this nice open source dish. Okay, I have no idea, really. At least it's free. Free software that lets me um, make a bunch of nice pretty graphs on the screen so that I can see... Um, temperatures, fan speeds, pretty much anything that it can be reported. And it, it, it turned out to be a really nice handy thing to compare the our, our two machines here. So, for example, my computer was... Uh, my uh, GTX 970 was getting maybe uh, 69 degrees Celsius under load, whereas Matt's was getting to around 89. So Whoa. That, that temperature difference wouldn't have been noticeable unless we had a nice graph over time to see it. Yeah. Um, but more intriguing than that is when the load ended, the graph would was very easy to see that my card cooled a lot faster and his stayed warm for a lot longer. Hmm. And so it turns yeah. out days after testing this, uh, Ars Technica did a story on uh, AMD Crimson, which is the new Catalyst Control Center branding, Basically, yeah, yeah. they're screwing up the fan profiles, and it's not working right. Yeah. So, oh, gosh. so AMD cards, watch out for those. I'm so glad I've gotten NVIDIA. Uh, let's see. It's NVIDIA. What do I have? Totally forgot what my graphics card is. Because it's uh, yeah, a GTX 750 Ti. Almost a year old now. Mm-hmm. Uh, or a year old in this machine. Probably like three years old in reality. I'm but, rocking a an NVIDIA 650M right now, but at home I rock at 760. Yeah. Nice. And uh, I think that's pretty much all the uh, follow-up that we need to cover today. This whole there, follow-up there is thing one is so more, I think there is one more thing in that, uh, in that message from Andrew, and that is about Bitbucket. He says, my company uses Bitbucket all day, every day. It's down as often as Google. And now this is where I editorialize and say, that's like pretty much never, um, which is true. Um, Atlassian is pretty darn cool. In fact, uh, we'll we'll get to another thing that's using Atlassian products in just a second, will we not? Um, and it's it, you know if it's good enough for uh, a certain fruit company, it's probably good enough for the rest of us. So, I I do apologize for my Atlassian hate because it wasn't just only. <laughs> so so for example, in the last week on December second, which was what uh, four days ago, so that would have been Wednesday. Get, yeah. SSH, Git, and Miracle were down on on Bitbucket. So, oh really? Our 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 hate isn't unwarranted. The the downtime was less than forty minutes, probably here. Uh huh. So, I mean, it's not a big deal, but I'm That's just true. saying. Now, if you go back further in their is- issue history, you know, it's it's pretty pretty fair, you know. That's true. So you can you can uh, take a quick peek at that if you want uh their uh wasn't status it... bitbucket t- page yep, yep, yep. was sure github enough. down for a couple days of i don't know there was some uh hack from china i think it was yeah it was a ddos yeah or, or everybody guess, everybody wants guess, me just but... to call it dos now but <laughs> reminds me of something slightly different yeah <laughs> I, don't, I can't quit my tongue on it <laughs> Yeah, sure enough, as recently as uh, August 2013, there was uh, a DDoS against uh, Bitbucket, too. Huh, fascinating stuff. 
It happens. It does indeed. But anyhow, we've got some other topics to discuss today. Uh, the first one on here is sustainability in phones, computers, and electronics. What do you guys think about that? Um, what, do you well, mean I, by I sus- what do you mean by sustainability? So um, I am taking a sustainability course here. And last week, we took apart old cell phones. Now, mind you, nice. the one I took apart was a Nokia from 1996. So it was a bit different. But um, I think the, the program we were doing was kind of organized by Fairphone. Um, I can find the link. Um, and it's a, a more of a modular phone. I think this made the news in the tech circles for a little bit. I think it's so it's, it's a modular phone that you can kind of plug in components and fix yourself. Um, uh-huh. So you can have a phone that lasts a while and um, fix yourself. And if you want to upgrade something, you can just upgrade that one to component rather than replace the entire phone. Yeah, yeah. And I think they also take a, um, a big part in making sure their supply chain is... Um, ethical and fair towards their workers and countries nice. where they mine these metals and things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, th- there's there's been uh, substantial discussion about how uh, electronic companies are using a lot of um, materials that are uh, difficult to get or are um, causing companies to get involved in areas of conflict. Or yeah, that, that that's a thing, right? Conflict minerals or conflict yeah, materials. Yeah, yeah, totally. Mm-hmm. Um, Hey, yeah, look, the page just loaded, and I see right here on the front page of, of fairphone.com, we're starting with conflict-free minerals from the DRC to uh, stimulate alternative solutions. Hey, cool, conflict-free materials are cool stuff. So, yeah, it seems like a really slick project. Maybe. Maybe. And I'll, I'll put a, um, a teardown from iFixit. Their score of the Fairphone is 10 out of 10. Nice. Quite interesting to see on a smartphone. Definitely. Absolutely. I think their server might need a bit of an upgrade. Um, so I'm, I'm reading here the specs of the uh, Fairphone. That, that, those are pretty decent specs, as, you know, especially if you can interchange them sometime in the future. Definitely. It, I think it's just interesting to see, you know, they have like pin-based connections onto the motherboard versus yeah. ribbon cables or direct soldering. It's kind of cool. Well, so have you guys heard of uh, the Project Aura from the Google? Yeah, I, I used to be a part of the... Uh... The uh, brainstorming mailing list for that for a long time, but then I realized I didn't have any ideas. Well, <laughs> is that another similar type modular thing? It, it is. Yeah. It is fairly similar. It might be a little bit more um, rich in taste. Let's mm-hmm. just say because of Google and yeah, their definitely. boatload of money they're pouring into it. Definitely. Um, they for a long time they were using these super duper powerful magnets. Yep. To lock in the modules and so there was no no connections externally on any component yeah um but i i've uh, you know this this kind of thing has been speculated on for years like you know if we can make our computers be modular you know we can exchange a graphics card we could exchange um you know we can put a different monitor in if we can put a different cd drive in whatever you know why can't our phones be in a similar format and mm-hmm. you know, I just, I just don't know about that. It becomes a a battle between um, sustainability, modularity, and design and form and function. I think. You know, I instead of for, for me, instead of putting all this money towards making the phones modular for user, I would prefer prefer if there was that kind of infrastructure put in place so that. When a phone's done being used, it could be recycled and, you know, instead of some paltry number of percentage of its components being reused, a lot more could. And I don't know. I just think that, like, for my Nexus 6 here, when I'm done with it, I'm going to give it to somebody. And then if when they're done with it, they'll probably just, I don't know, throw it out, probably. And I don't think a normal person would ever even think about upgrading their phone with different components, just like a normal person doesn't think about upgrading their computer with different components. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's true. Definitely. That seems fair. But but the, of course, if it of... happened, people might yeah. get into that mindset. It's, it's just, I think we might be looking at the hardware too soon or too early. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Well, you you bring up a good point and something that a lot of I know like the, there's there's some hardware hardware design classes at the U or um, sorry 
not hardware design so much as industrial design classes. And a lot of what they're looking at is using alternative materials that can be recycled as you're describing, Ryan. Mm-hmm. So I mean, I think that's, that's something that's almost more useful. Uh, you know, if you, if you're one of those unfortunate people who bring their phones in, you know, every two years on contract to, you mm-hmm. know, trade it in to get the next phone. Well, what, what is, what is T-Mobile? What is AT&T going to do with that old phone? Well, if it's ancient and not an iPhone, they're going to recycle it. Mm-hmm. So they're not going to take the Snapdragon 801 chip out and put a Snapdragon 810 and resell it. No, they're just they're just going to get rid of it. <laughs> yeah, and you get you get to a limit there with stuff too because eventually you you know like a computer you have to get a new motherboard every so right. often, and so then you have do something and old other things, and it, at a point you have to draw the line and say, okay, we need to start over here. Right. So, and so we, we always, ex- uh, you know, speculated when Project R actually came out some unfortunate distant time in the future, ugh, that even if it did work, there would only be a certain number of modules anyway. But then over time, there would be more modules, but the likelihood of compatibility between them all would go down so fast. Totally. Yeah, totally. And then, of course, you get to that same issue with, you know, like, PC versus Mac, like, oh, look at us, you know, we're Mac people, and we have computers that work with our operating system. And then the <laughs> PC people are like, oh, but look at us, we can play games on our computers. And 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 it's just going to be that all over again. Yeah. Yep. No drivers. more holy wars. Hey, there are no drivers. There are no drivers whatsoever. By the way, I've got a little aside here uh, re- relating to repairability and drivers. So one of my friends, who is really awesome, uh, she's not a computer science major, but she runs Linux and uh, as, as her daily driver operating system. She doesn't dual boot in Windows. She literally only uses Linux, and she is amazing. Um, but she was having some weird trouble. She got this laptop from Micro Center. Um, it's pretty nice, um, you know, pretty reasonable, middle of the road uh, Acer, and um, all of a sudden the power button started sticking, and it was like, oh crap. The one, the one thing you can't fix on Linux mm-hmm. is the hardware, the machine. So sure enough, I, you know, she she brings her laptop in, and uh, we we start taking it apart so we can uh, get all the data off and send it in for for repairs to Asus, right? And I open the thing up, and it is ludicrous. I wish I would have t- taken a picture. Um, I thought, you know, just like on the old style Mac. So sure enough, as we're trying to uh, to remove the bottom case of this laptop. Um, I find out that it's... Have you guys ever seen Halt and Catch Fire? No. Okay, well, this is a joke on Halt and Catch Fire. It's kind of a joke. Um, wherein they... what One of the characters is, is a hardware designer, and the other one's like a Steve Jobs type. And the hardware designer is like, we can't fit um, all of these components in, into this this tiny this tiny space. We can't do it. And the Steve Jobs guy's like, well, why don't you just fold it in half? Uh, so they they do that and it works and everyone's like oh look at that Steve Jobs slash Lee Pace is such a cool dude uh, anyhow that's kind of what what seemed to have happened with this Asus laptop there were two halves of the logic board uh, yep. one underneath the keyboard and one on the side of the uh, the the rear panel of the uh, of the laptop so when you take it apart there are all these ribbon cables crisscrossing over it and you have oh, to be wow. really careful otherwise you're gonna break something really really important um and sure enough at least three of these ribbon cables happen to be crisscrossing the hard drive Mm. so i was like oh crap what are we going to do now uh but then i realized that in the process we managed to jiggle free the power switch so now the power switch was working uh so even though we weren't able to back up the, the stuff we were able to uh not have to send it in any longer because we fixed the original problem which is kind of a slick uh a slick thing that I guess only happens if you do the I fix it thing. Um, so some degree of modularity is still pretty cool. It's nice to not have to send it halfway around the world to fix a spring. And, and of course, you know we have this this trend in laptops right now where opening the RAM bay. Are you kidding? No way. You can't yeah, do right? that. So right? there there's a thing where it's funny that we want our phones to suddenly become changeable, but mm-hmm. we don't. We, we we purposely sacrifice that on laptops and to some degree desktops. No, totally. I feel like people are becoming more phone users and less computer users. No, their phone is their main device for general consumption. 
And so, you know, you're going to care more about your main device. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Those Definitely. poor people. Uh, anyhow, we've got some other exciting stuff to talk about. Uh, two major projects went open source recently. Swift. Hooray. Uh, that's right. That is right. So it's all on GitHub. You can check it out uh, right now at github.com slash Apple. Uh, and includes a couple of fun things. In addition to the regular old Swift C that, we're, that we all know and love, the REPL, actually, the, the read eval print loop is uh, working for the most part. Um, it's not working on my Debian machine right now because I had to compile it from source and none of my executables are in the right place as a result. But uh, if you download one of the binary distributions from swift.org, um, it seems like the REPL would be working there. Um, in addition, they've got a package manager that was made, uh, or at least designed, by the guy behind Homebrew, which is pretty cool. Um, so you Max can get Hell. all that. Yeah, right. You can get all that, um, all that awesome. Uh, it, it's it's really interesting how Apple's been hiring for the community to get stuff like this happen. I mean, uh, Max is definitely one of those people. And uh, b- before him, there was Anon from Anon Tech and mm-hmm. Chris Latner. So it, it, that seems like a cool tack that they're taking. What do you guys think? I thought um, just on that line of hi- Apple hiring people, um, when yeah. Swift came out, I saw several tweets of people going through commits and saying, oh, this person works for Apple now. This person works for Apple now. People <laughs> yep. didn't know. And it was just kind of interesting to see, oh, this guy from Panic now works at Apple. Yeah, uh, right. Things like that. And I thought that was quite fun. Yeah, that kind of transparency is really not normal from them and it's really nice to be able to see that yeah i was i was absolutely like gobsmacked that they decided to keep their entire commit history i don't that's that's pretty awesome i'm i we in the fringe we talked more about this but we we wondered how long they had this git repo full of swift stuff going and then Mm -hmm. how long it had been up on github before becoming public and announced yeah it definitely seems like they've kept their entire git history from the initial start of the project on up yeah. The first commit message was initial check-in, comma, nothing much to see here. Back in That's 2010. awesome. That is awesome. And every, yeah, it, it seems like they at least have the record of all the contributors, even if they weren't using GitHub the whole time. Yeah. But Th- we talked more about that good. in the fringe, you're right. <laughs> um, also, I think, um, I'm just going through my tweets of that day. Um, yeah, they have the full history of 20, I think now 29,000 commits. It's quite nice. impressive. So everything is there rather than old open source Apple where they just would dump at every release, say, here you go. You can't edit it. Can't see what was changed line by line. You know, it's here's your new version. Um, and then also um, they're dropping the NX prefix from Yay. their classes. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. It's about pretty time. Pretty awesome. Syracuse tweeted, congratulations if you had 2016 or later in the when will Apple drop the NX the NS prefix betting pool from 1997? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I thought that was pretty fun. Totally. Yeah, there's there's some other really cool stuff coming out of uh, that Swift project too. Uh, looks like we've got the uh, common mark implementation uh, in Swift, so you can uh, render. Uh, the version of Markdown specified in the common mark specification uh, using regular old native Swift modules. So it's it's pretty darn slick. I have to admit I haven't used it yet, but um, one of the things that they even describe in the readme that I thought was just awesome is that you might want to use CMark on the back end to render your Markdown and something like common mark JS on, uh, on the front end. Hmm. I'm not sure... I can't think of immediately a case where I would use that in my daily life, but that's probably because I'm not a Swift developer right now. So but. I wonder. So this is this is great for you know all those iOS developers who want to include some Markdown like features in their application, right? But so this is this is first class since they wrote it, right? Totally. So how many apps that implement some Markdown module right now switch to this and then? make angry all the people who want just old markdown and not common mark that's a very good point i mean i don't i don't know how compatible they are so i mean it could just not be a real a real issue but it would be an annoying thing for people to be angry yeah well that that's that's a really interesting point because i just thought of um gruber and Mm -hmm. brent simmons's app uh vesper right yep and that uses that uses markdown 
Yeah, it uh, should use Markdown. I agree. I have to wonder with because um, I, I imagine a lot of use of Markdown is for web, and you know you might have your your post written in Markdown, and then you render it and serve it as HTML. Right. And I'm wondering if if Apple's just trying to get a little push for someone making a another web framework competitor with Swift. I think that would be interesting to see. Well, yeah, there's, absolutely. So do you mean like a language like Swift, but for web use? Or, yeah, you know, using another, I don't know, another, I don't know what, I mean, Node is written with JavaScript or for server-side JavaScript. I don't, I don't know, Swift could be used for some server-side. Swift yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think there's any reason why you large. couldn't use Swift for anything on the web. I, there's, there should be no problem with that. Yeah. Like uh, envisioning something like Swift on Rails? <laughs> Yeah, um, so. I'm thinking like Swift on Wings. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> what does it say? Swift on. There we go. Yes, I like your yeah. Swift on security tweet. Yep, yep. Uh, no, I, I, I totally agree. And like every every once in a while, like every time I get one of those messages from the Swift mailing list, I'm like, hmm, I, I should really try my hand at writing a. a uh, a web uh, framework in the in the style of Express.js or something uh, in Swift, but then I remember that I have finals coming up, and yeah. I don't. I've never really done such a thing before, and that seems like kind of a massive undertaking. Yeah. So I will not do that mm-hmm. until After. until winter break. Yep. Or ever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm in the same situation now. Like I have all these things I want to try, but can't. Mm-hmm. Too busy. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, so there's just a couple. So overall, this all this Swift stuff, do do we see the language being used more now, or is there what what's the next big thing for the language and its usage at Apple coming up at WWDC, for example? Um, hmm. So there are a couple of things that I've been seeing right now on the mailing list, the Swift users mailing list in particular, that seems to be coming up a lot. Uh, right now, it seems like a lot of people are just trying to get the compiler running on as many platforms as possible, which mm-hmm. is pretty slick. Uh, but some people are talking about using it to build Android apps, even. Really? Which is like, what? But um, yeah, people are talking about how to get Swift running on an Android device, um, and you know, on an Arduino and on Raspberry Pis and stuff like that. And Arduino seems uh, that the the uh, conventional wisdom seems to be that the runtime itself that you need to to run a Swift app is too large to run on a Raspberry or so. On a, so does Swift come with a run t- runtime then? Is that is that a thing? Um, I think it vaguely does. I I, I, I assume the, the I assume the runtime is contained in the executable, though. That's correct. That's oh correct. well, that's not a big deal then. They just need to trim that down. Yeah. So are, yeah, are people basically. hoping to use Swift for Android apps so they can write once and deploy for both? Uh, uh, that seems to be with, with some compatibility things. Yeah. along the way too. Yeah. That might be ideal, but I mean. Maybe it would be okay for like, um, you know, service level things, but not UI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So your core logic. Yeah. So like same. communicating with the network, or you know, patching data in and out, but the UI would still be custom. Yeah, yeah definitely, definitely. Well, I was just but- reading here the Swift programming language guide, and yeah, I, I've looked at this before when it came out a year and a half ago, but I uh, haven't looked at it since. And you know, it's you know just uh, one of these newfangled languages that are basically the same as all the other newfangled languages. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Like it, it's remarkably you know- similar to Rust in modern JavaScript, but with oh types. yeah, absolutely. It it feels very similar to ES six when when you're writing it or ES twenty fifteen. Yeah, with types. Very very similar. Got to got to stress with the types. Yep. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So so again, um, what what do we expect from Apple for Swift at the WWDC? I heard rumblings of a new Xcode. Is that a thing? I I bet I can't imagine they they. Uh, leave Xcode in the dust. They have to better integrate the Swift package manager is one thing in particular. Um, mm-hmm. That's that's one thing that's been kind of blowing up the users list. Um, they you know they really need a registry kind of like npm. Oh, it seems definitely. to be the conventional wisdom. They don't yeah. have that right now. They're just a bunch of GitHub repositories where people are saying, well, here's a Swift package and here's a Swift package and here's a Swift what, package. What are we going to call that package manager? Yeah. <laughs> Swift yeah. PM. Yeah, no. Swift, Swift PM is what it is now, but yeah, that's wrong. Okay, 
I know, and 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 they got the guy from Homebrew to do it too. And Homebrew is such a good name for a what it is package manager for Mac. Yeah, yeah. right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, so, okay. So. I, guess I think I I've, I've heard talk of about on um, the Xcode line. Um, you know, because Xcode kind of got its big redesign a couple of years ago when they bundled it all together. I think with Xcode yeah. four, and then their install size dropped significantly. But now it's been creeping up, and mm-hmm. now Xcode is three or four gigabytes, and you know, it crashes a lot. I haven't seen as many tweets as I used to a year or two ago, maybe, but I feel, yeah, a reason might be good. And I've also heard people saying they want Xcode for iPad Pro because uh, if, if, if an iPad is a pro device, then they need to be able to do professional things on it, such as developing an Xcode. But, but, then I think the, but wouldn't that be violating their own rules, though? I mean... They're Apple. But yeah, I, I, I don't know what to think about that. I think that is a whole new level of complexity to get through. And it's just not worth it. Yeah. Uh, I know where you can get Xcode from Apple. It's called on a computer. <laughs> exactly. That's, yeah, that's true. I, I have to admit that if I ignore all of the practical reasons why they wouldn't do this, I would love to run Xcode on my iPad. Um, but it's pretty darn cool that I can just SSH into my Linux box, for example, or let alone, like, you know, God forbid, my iMac um, <laughs> and my hypothetical iMac that I don't own. Um, and and run it from there in a VNC container or something, and it'd probably be roughly similar. Um, I mean, I because guess of all the fiddly things that you'd need to. I guess they could make like a, an Xcode Lite or something that's more of a code reader. Yeah. Um, yeah, or maybe a Swift Playground, but not. But not not a full coding and then compiling environment, because that would, again yeah. would break the rules. I so. Yeah. Um, I yeah. I, I think the install says the total install size of Xcode with SDK and documentation is like 10 gigabytes. <laughs> yeah. That sounds Run that right. on a 16 so gigabyte it's... iPhone. Yeah. Ooh, uh, that's going to go well. Yeah. Sorry, no space to update. Please try again. Yeah. I saw a, a message pop up in someone's tweet the other day um, that they had no more space. And so iOS is offering to remove and uninstall a few apps, update, and then reinstall the apps. Huh? I thought that was interesting. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Well, what there do you was, think? Does that just about do it for Slift? I think so. And and that brings us to another open sourcing for the week. Yep, that's right. Microsoft open sourced their Chakra JavaScript engine, which uh, under underpins their new Edge browser. Uh, it's pretty it's pretty slick, apparently. Um, you can read about it on the Windows uh, development blog. And uh, th- there's some kind of fascinating stuff that people are saying about it. For one thing... Um, People are suspecting that once it goes cross-platform, it might replace V8 as the uh, JavaScript engine that underpins Node. Yeah, I've heard that it's um, super fast and yeah, not not too surprising there. But but of course, the first picture on that blog post is literally source code goes into a parser, which turns into AST, which turns into a bytecode generator, which turns into bytecode. And man, I love compilers. No, totally. Just right? want to let you know. I know nothing about compilers, so this is a good contrast. It's it's pretty slick, uh, but one of the, one of the other things that's kind of nice about uh, Chakra is that it claims to be the most ES6 compliant um, of all the JavaScript engines out there today, including V8 and Spider Monkey. That's what Firefox is using, right? And yeah. um, Babel is kind of up there at seventy one percent. Where is Safari or WebKit? Apparently, WebKit's oh, back on. Uh, so this is going to be this is going to be a funny question. But what is JSRT? JSRT. Uh, it it appears many times in their uh, page here, but they don't actually tell me what the acronym stands for. Hmm. You're right. I feel like I read that. I read that in there too. Oh. JavaScript runtime hosting. Yeah. What does that mean? Yeah. Uh, I've got an MSDN article for you right here that has theoretically some info. All right. So that is a so way So it's kind of that... like JScript, but newer. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. That's for, that works for me. Yep. Gosh, so I've does, never used JScript. <laughs> um, where, where does Microsoft host their now open source browser? Or are they just going to release it? It is on GitHub. Uh, is. I, I think they have a, a blank repo for it in GitHub. I think it's coming out in... January. Okay. But let me see. 
want to say they have a blank repo for it, but I could be wrong. Do they have the uh, or Yeah, it's going to be um, open sourcing the chapter core on GitHub next month sometime. So we don't know what specific Wait, next date. month is January. Yeah. Oh my. <laughs> Yikes! Yeah, you're right. Well, that that way they can, um, uh, you know, control F for all of the proprietary parts and take them out. Mm-hmm. Control F to do remove. <laughs> yeah, I uh, gotta love that. Cool. Well, what do you guys think? Would you would you want to use this in place of V8, or would well, you prefer I think it, to stick with where you're at? I you think, think it'd be nice to have it as an option. Yeah. Um, it would also be interesting to see if if. So it depends on how much of it they release. If they release the full stack of it in a browser and it's interoperable enough with iOS, well, not really iOS, but with Android at least, because you can actually run alternative browsers on Android, it'd be cool to see Windows make a browser for Android, uh, which is probably something they are probably thinking pretty heavily about because Windows Phone is not doing too well. Yeah, absolutely. So that that could be, you know, one of those things they get their foot in the door with. Uh, hey, we made a browser for Android. Oh, hey, we just forked Android. Oh, what now? <laughs> yeah. Oh, hey, we own Android. Oh, we, we hey, you know those Android. $15 licensing fees you pay? 30 if you don't use us. Yep. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> So I think that there's that. Um, but for, for a nicer point of view of the world where Microsoft doesn't do that, I think it would be also interesting if Chakra becomes um, something we embrace and don't hate. Uh, you know, at some point we have gotten used to our Chrome web-based or WebKit-based world. Yeah. And, you know, when when one platform owns... 70 percent ish is that right now or is it more yep yep 80 percent of the market you know everything becomes too easy again Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so maybe maybe if we can get those those um market shares down a little bit you know 45 percent for each big one that'd be okay yep that seems fair that seems totally fair well, with that i think that brings us into uh everyone's favorite segment which is who are you following on Twitter this week? And I, of course, have about 15 new people that I've followed. <laughs> uh, cut it down by a, a factor of five, so I'm, I'm giving you the, the top three. Um, the first of which is going to be uh, Susan Kerr, who you might know as the person who designed basically all of the icons of classic Mac OS. Yep. Um, she is an awesome person, and I can't believe I didn't follow her until this week. Uh, but there you go. I follow her now, and you should too. Uh, additionally, I also added uh, Rachel Baker, who is the lead engineer for Wirecutter and The Sweet Home, um, who is an, another awesome person. She tweets a lot about WordPress things and uh, and uh, related kind of PHP community stuff uh, and just general awesome things, you know, the, like the general kind of awesomeness you, you could expect from somebody who works at the Wirecutter. So. Cool, cool, cool. And finally, there is Greg Boone, who is uh, a Minnesotan uh, who tweets a lot about uh, uh, government and technology. So he's part of 18F, which is kind of like the U.S. government's own skunk works of awesome people. Um, and if, have you guys heard of 18F at all? Mm, I don't think so. Uh, oh, they are awesome. Like, like way awesome. Um, 18F did the uh, U.S. government's... Uh, like common style sheet framework, right? Uh, let me see if I can find it. 18f.gov, I think, is where you can go to figure it out. Um, they do um, a lot of work for the uh, for different agencies about like rebuilding their own their websites and stuff. Um, let me so see. Try to modernize and standardize. Okay, they're on yeah. GitHub as well. Yep. 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 You bet. Uh, so they do a lot of stuff related to opening up um, APIs uh, for government agencies. Um, so is, that kind of like, is it kind of like mm-hmm. a spinoff from the um, UDUS? Yeah, the digital service, yeah. yeah. I, I think it is. I think it's kind of like their skunk works of super awesome okay. people. Okay, yeah, that, that's and, pretty cool then. 
and Greg is definitely a super awesome person. Uh, his most recent tweet is about uh, GIS data for Minnesota, which is now available over HTTPS by default, which is pretty slick. Uh, the fact that it's available at all is pretty darn cool too. Mm-hmm. Um, so he tweets a lot about government and tech policy and um, stuff that's going on over there. So it's it's pretty slick, pretty awesome follow. 10 out of 10 would follow again. Very nice. Uh, I followed two new people this week in on uh, probably within the same hour, so around the Swift time. So I followed Swift Lang, so the Swift language, and Max Howell, who we meant, mentioned earlier, who did Homebrew and now does Swift PM. So sad. Nice. What about you, Ryan? Well, I don't follow any, anybody new. However, earlier this week, I um, came down here to the studio and turned on my computer, and suddenly I found the screen waiting for me all your files are exactly where you left them and you know i i was just sitting here waiting for my computer to boot so i could go play guild wars or something and i took this picture and i tweeted it and suddenly minutes later uh my former professor retweets my picture and um this is gregory here he uh was my professor for software engineering i think he works at a different university now in south carolina southern california south california Somewhere. One of those. I don't know. And, You're right. So- uh, South Carolina. Yeah. And um, so then immediately after that, I I think I got like 20 interactions, like 20 retweets and 20 likes <laughs> um, because of this picture. And that was pretty cool. I don't think I've had or 37, famous. Thir- 37 likes and um, nine retweets. Yeah. And, and that's that's pretty much my most popular picture tweet ever. Nice. So that that was the new thing for the week. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, cool. And and all my files were indeed exactly where I left them. I think. No. Did you check all of them? Every last one. I, I in fact I even checked the ones I knew should be gone and they were gone. Gotcha. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. So we have a minute and a half left. So uh, what are you guys doing next week and this upcoming week? Let's see. So this week, I am finishing up Computer Science 2021 Machine Architecture and Organization. Aren't you excited? Uh, I am so excited. I actually really love the topics that we're going into right now. We're implementing a cache simulator. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's going to be so much fun. Um, Yesterday, or not yesterday, but last week, well, kind of yesterday too, I was just pretty much freaking out about how how well the class is going to go. But right now, I'm just like really, really, really excited for the material. And I'm hoping that'll carry me through. I'm also finishing up 2011 and a really awesome user interface and design course where we're re-implementing class search. I think I talked about that last week. Nice. Um, and we're using Rails and we're using pure CSS and we're using a bunch of Ruby modules that my awesome coworker is making um, who is like literally an awesome person. I hope that someday I can I can drag him kicking and screaming to a microphone so you guys can meet him because That'd be pretty cool. he, is, he is a cool dude. Um, yeah, you guys, you guys would enjoy it. Um, and I think that's most, most of, uh, what's up for me? Probably going to be messing around with Swift in every spare moment because, um, it's basically like my dream language, as you might imagine. Yep. Um, it's begging That's about it for me. Yeah. How about you, Brian? Uh, I am done with classes now. I have a one, one paper to write this week and, um, I was kind of hanging out. It's my last week in my... The dorm here in Copenhagen before I go spend some time with my extended family for Christmas and go back to the oh, US. Nice. So I'll be going around Copenhagen a bit, seeing some things, buying some Christmas presents for people. Cool. So, awesome. You know. What about you, Ryan? Well, this is my, I think it's our last full week of class, right? Because we still have a couple of days next week. That's right. Yeah. Because the University of Minnesota Twin Cities loves to be weird. You and gotcha. And uh, let's see here. I have to work on my e-voting project for um, c- computer ethics. That's uh, right. Uh, so I, I, I have here what I call a diagram of how not to vote e- e-voting <laughs> like. Nice. Um, basically, e-voting is a bad thing, and you shouldn't try it, and you shouldn't even ask for it because it's bad. Uh, in addition uh. to that, uh, you know, just just a couple of last projects to finish up, and then I'm I'm done. Awesome! Nice. Congrats! I get to escape. Woo-hoo. So you're yeah. graduating then? Yep, yep. Oh my gosh! Mm-hmm. Infinite, 
internet high fives. Yeah. <laughs> coming your way. All of them forever. That is awesome. I, I do have a couple I do have a couple of things that I want to toss in here at the very, very last minute. A couple of really awesome user groups uh, in Minnesota are throwing some sort of a December bash. Um, Swift Minnesota, so that's Swift.mn and JavaScript Minnesota. Um, both of the links for those are going to be in the show notes. They've got stuff going on for December cool. and it's going to be awesome. Um, there are thought Swift Minnesota did, but of course now it doesn't look like they are. Sad day. I do, you know, yeah, I'm not so sure about Swift Minnesota, so maybe I'll take that one out. <laughs> but JavaScript Minnesota, I know because I happen to, uh, I happen to know some of the uh, organizers for it. Um, they are doing a really awesome meeting for December, and it will be uh, at Coco and Uptown. Uh, you guys should take a look at it because we're going to be doing some awesome lightning talks. And after the lightning talks are done, we'll probably just do a little bit of a fun hackathon thing uh, where everyone just brings stuff they're working on and can. Uh, get some help on it or help other people who are doing awesome stuff. It's always great fun. So. That's pretty cool. Cool. Yeah, I saw Sweet. that they um, didn't do a November meetup, but yeah. Yep, that we, they canceled it so we can make the December one twice as awesome. That's what you do. <laughs> that's the plan. That's nice. what you do indeed. Yeah, well, that sounds good. Well, uh, where can we find you on the internet? Well, you can find me on Twitter at Brandon underscore MN. You can also find me on my website, which is now awesomely parallel, Brandon.MN. Uh, you can also find me hanging around uh, Union Depot in St. Paul because trains are cool. Nice. Or at uh, hopping between my offices on the East Bank and West Bank campus of the University of Minnesota. How about you, Brian? You can find me on Twitter at TheMan4789 or Tech4789. Or uh, walking around Copenhagen and... Yep, that's that's probably the best place to find me. <laughs> what about you, Ryan? Well, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on the Twitter at RyanMar. And of course, you can also find me on Google Plus posting pictures of the CSE Light Show from the University of Minnesota campus, where they have maybe uh, 200,000 LED lights or something insane. It's pretty cool. Nice. And awesome. uh, you can also find me walking to the train various times of the day. I like the train. Trains are good. I agree with you. Trains are pretty awesome. All right. I think that just about does it for this week. See you all in the relatively near future. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. See you later. Have a good one. Thanks for listening to Podkit. For more, listen to The Fringe and listen to the next episode too.